My introduction is uh, we've just done some of it. I've shared some of my experiences. Um, one of the things that I've noticed about people's opinions, because I, as you can imagine, I've been doing this a long time and I've had a lot of accusations uh, aimed at me. I've had many nasty letters written to me from students and the parents of students and the friends and you, you name. I've had many long letters from Christians uh, telling me how I'm going to burn in hell and I'm a sinner. Uh, probably the most common thing I get labeled with is being a cult leader uh, because I have two wives. And I tell people, well, if I'm running a cult, I'm doing a very shitty job because I teach people to take responsibility for themselves, eat well, live well, love well, care for the planet, and take responsibility for the decisions they make, which is the opposite of a cult leader. So I've completely failed in the thing I'm accused of being the most. So have you guys had any of these kind of accusations put on you? Sure. Yeah. So you know the, the ropes. Um, I've also noticed that the judgments – in general from people about multiple partner relationships are usually a good measure of the level of consciousness they're at. If you look at the structure stages of consciousness and how we grow consciously through our own uh, psychic evolution, um, I found that a person's judgments about multiple partner relationships usually mirror their judgments about abortion, uh, about uh, issues of religion, about vaccinations, about anything, uh, uh, circumcision, almost anything, how they view one, if you structure, if you categorize that in the structure stages of consciousness, their views on multiple partner religions usually are not a structure stage above or below. They're, in other words, the way they see the world is the way they see the world no matter what they're looking at. Have you seen yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, this is... <clears throat> This is a particularly challenging topic, though, because yeah. people like to put themselves in the perspective of the person talking. So if we're openly discussing this, a man can't help but put him in the situation where potentially his wife or his girlfriend is sleeping with somebody else. Yes. So that gets them very emotional. Yes, it does. So that will actually drop their consciousness. Yeah. It's a defense lower. reaction. Yeah, it's a defense reaction. Yeah. They'll drop their awareness and consciousness even lower than perhaps their resting rate would be yeah. because of the emotional turbulence that it will cause. And I found that the people that react that way are often the ones that have something going on the side in the closet. <laughs> and so their, their fear is that they might have to meet themselves and their partner. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? If they're cheating, they don't want to actually conceive that their partner might also be cheating. So as soon as we start having these kinds of conversations, they project an attack on it, which is very much like uh, someone who is a closet gay who goes to anti-gay rallies yeah, only later to be found out. And then, you know, the, the barn burns down, so to speak. So... Um, one of the things I wanted to start with is let's begin from the beginning because basically the psyche, as you both know, is, is really a system of archetypes. Archetypes are energy transformers. They're manifolds. They're empty forms. Uh, the archetype is always – it's, it's in, quantum, in, in chaos theory, it's called a strange attractor. It's something that draws something to itself. Our first – relationship with a woman is with our mother and our first relationship with a man is with our father and our first imprinting about what a relationship is and how it should function is the relationship our mother and father have. So I'd, I'd love to hear from each of you, what was your relationship with your mother like? How did she love you? Uh, how did you learn to love her? How does that relate to the way you love women or you relate to women? And then let's move from there to dad, and then let's move from there to what did your parents exemplify to you in relationship to monogamy, or uh, was there experiences where one was wandering, or you know, what was your imprint that you think potentially has influenced the choices that you're making today, if that makes sense to you? So mother, father, yeah. relationship. I'll jump in on this one. I think uh, mother is very, very clear to me. I always felt for 
for better or worse, however my parents raised me, they always showed me love. And I could feel that love. They, they were affectionate. They would hold me and my sister. They would mention how much they loved me all the fucking time. I have many memories of that. There was no shortage of that. Um, I felt a close connection to my mom, and I always loved her playfulness. Like mm -hmm. she reminded me of, to a fault, being a big kid, which mm -hmm. is now something that I, I really try to embody, mm -hmm. is taking le life less serious and, and – um, you know, I mean, to this day, she'll be the first person to crack a joke when she enters a room. And, um, you know, so I, and, and really being chippy and fiery, I see so many of those things in my wife, Natasha. And it's funny how that kind of circles. I don't think they look the same, but they definitely have similar personality traits. Yeah. Um, my father was pretty strict. And I mentioned this, you know, a little bit on the, on the show that we did together doing yeah. the hero's journey. Um, but also felt a lot of love from him. And I have a lot of good memories of him, um, you know, throwing the football three flies up to me and all my friends in for an entire day yeah. until the sun went down. And, um, but looking at their relationship, that third imprint where I saw them interact, um, that was more of a teaching on what not to do. You right. know? And, and I had mentioned, um, whatever nonviolent communication is, which is a great book, whatever that is and exemplifies, they spoke to each other the opposite way. Yeah. So um, those were those were all the cues for me. Like, like neither one of them knew how to fold their hand. Neither one of them knew how to say I'm sorry until it was too late. Um, and both had a burning desire to be right, to be yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. And so those are all lessons that I've taken forward because, again, I, my wife is fiery and in a lot of ways resembles my mom. Mm -hmm. um, even though she's her own person. And, and certainly I've, I've felt called to really know when to uh, bend the knee to take a turn from, from Game of Thrones, which we're into. Mm. But just to know like, like when to, to preemptively to come across with a softer, gentler way of communication has been one of the ways that we've kind of bridged that gap and not gone down the same uh, path that my parents did. So... Before we move on to Aubrey, if you could share, looking at the way you're living now, if you were to go back to your childhood and look into a crystal ball, what's happening in your childhood that leads to Kyle being who he is today in multiple partner relationships? Well, I mean, I, I, would, I would have to look at that. If there's anything from my childhood that led me to him, who I am today in multiple partner relationships, it's how I treat each individual relationship. Mm -hmm. But nothing from my childhood... In my opinion, let me, of course I can't, couldn't possibly. Well, we'll find but, out shortly. Yeah, but it's like <laughs> there, there isn't much from that. You know, my parents didn't cheat on each other, as far as I knew. I find out later that that some of that had happened, but um, it wasn't something I was aware of. You know, I think even that, like, this wasn't a concept that I would really become familiar with. I'd heard about people in the Bay Area doing it. It's where I'm from. San Francisco is pretty big community of of polyamorous people. Yeah, um, but it wasn't until like really following Aubrey Marcus and. And, uh, you know, Dr. Chris Ryan's book, Sex at Dawn, came out. Yes, and that was a big book for me, And I read it, and I was too. like, holy shit. Like, it made so much sense on so many levels. And that conversation really became uh, the impetus for my wife and I to, to start working through a lot of this because everything's a trigger. Yeah. And I think the, the more we talked about it and the more serious we got in the conversation about actually doing it, yeah. the more shit that started coming up for us. And it was a, a great way to work through I want to say a lot of the stuff, but still there's nothing like actually going through it. No, no. Good. That's, that's great. Thank you. And I'd love to hear your story, Aubrey, because <laughs> I haven't really had a chance to talk to you about some of these things. Well, my mother was uh, and is one of the greatest examples of unconditional love that I've ever encountered. That's amazing. And it's really, truly, truly remarkable. Yeah. And um, that I had that same thing from my grandmother as well. Mm -hmm. Um not so much with my father. Father was loving, but also very conditional. Loving, I love you if, if yeah. you perform well, if you mm -hmm. do this, if you haven't said something that will bring me into a rage. She used to go into these fits of rage that would leave me really um, nervous about when the next one would come. Right. Um, but my mom and my dad split up when I was like two. So they were only oh. together like three years. Wow. And then one of the things that definitely influenced my own um relationship understanding and my needs for validation was my mother got with um my stepfather who was the opposite of my father in a lot mm -hmm. of ways he was this big my dad was very cerebral a commodities trader very kind of in his own head and not very physically dominant by any means mm -hmm. and then she got with this 
gigantic silver back of a man <laughs> and then he was like the SWAT team squad leader the guy who would kick down the door with the shotgun wow. uh, NCAA football and wrestling and as a manly a man physically as you could get so some part and I've recognized this through you know a lot of introspection and ceremony a lot of my own feeling was that okay the greatest woman in the world represented by my mother will leave the cerebral one mm -hmm for the most physically dominant one. Mm. So that's been a pattern that I've had to become aware of that I needed to feel like I was the most physically dominant in order to be loved. Right, that's a very good observation. Yeah. So uh, how much of a, of, of a factor do you think that's had on the development of on it and the 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 jujitsu, the, the conditioning, right? Is it, this mm -hmm. is a, you know, obviously a, center f where there's a lot of um physical development going on yeah i mean i think it played a big role in my whole life mm -hmm. you know i mean i think that desire to be loved by the whoever was filling the role of the greatest woman in the world the person who i was with right like mm -hmm. the desire to be loved by them and being having that be conditional upon me being physically dominant and superior definitely yeah. was a driving force for me to keep pushing the boundaries in that way Fortunately, it's also one of the ways that sport and training is also one of the ways that I can get out of my head, which is probably one of my biggest challenges. Mm. I inherited that from my father, a very a tendency to be caught in cerebral mental loops that are a form of deep suffering, really, until I can get embodied and get in flow and get actually grounded through my feet. Um, so that's also led me into yoga and led me into a lot of the other practices as well as finding the ways to escape the tyrant of the mind yeah. and, uh, and kind of get out of that. But so I think it's been both, um, both have been there, but I think for sure, you know, having the, you know, me putting the external validation from the women I was with trying to show me that I was worthy of love, right? you know, it w was definitely one of the driving forces that probably caused me to want to open up in the first place. Now, right. A lot of other things the books i was reading the uh, my understanding of love not being possessed and love mm. being wild and there was a lot of other factors in there plus just the natural human tendency to desire the novelty yeah. myself yeah. um but you know i was really really overconfident and underestimating how much work would be in it for me I mean, i've been yeah. completely blown away by how challenging and how deep deep the lessons have been from being in this open relationship and allowing my partner Whitney to have the freedom to be with men sexually and fall in love with them and mm -hmm. and whatever you know her heart and body desired has mm -hmm. been uh, has been permitted and that's a, that's a hell of a journey man